what we've done is we've we've taken seventy five hundred dollars from every American or sixteen sixteen thousand five hundred from every taxpayer, mm -hmm. sixteen thousand dollars from every taxpayer, and then given some of those taxpayers a check for twelve hundred dollars. That that's that's not helping. We, uh, yeah. We've taken two and a half trillion dollars and only given three hundred and fifty five billion to small businesses. Where's the rest going? Same place it went last time. I'm Dave Rubin and this is The Rubin Report. Joining me today is the founder of The Blaze, the host of the Glenn Beck radio program and the author of the new book, Arguing with Socialists. Glenn Beck, welcome back to The Rubin Report. Thanks, man, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, you know, we are in the midst of a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> and I'm in the People's Republic of California, so I probably have a shorter so, lease on life than you do, uh, but I'm okay. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm glad I'm in New York, glad I'm not in L.A., you know, I moved to the uh, center of the country for a reason, and uh, this would be it. This would be it. <laughs> So I guess the first obvious question here, uh, beyond just the general how you doing during Corona, is uh, as a guy who's sort of been in mainstream media and out of mainstream media and a, and a trailblazer in new media, did you ever think you'd be doing your show from home like Dave Rubin does his show from home all the time? I, I tell you something, Dave, it is because I've, I've been in broadcast for like 42 years now. Um, the technology and what we can accomplish now, we couldn't have accomplished even 10 years ago. It's phenomenal. It's really phenomenal uh, how, how the power of the media really is in the hands of the average person if they care to take it. It's really crazy. So how is it treating you in the middle of the country where you are at least a little bit kind of safe? Yeah, um, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, it's not New York, thank God. Um, uh, Texas is still free, thank God. We've got a good uh, governor who is not trying to uh, tell everybody exactly what to do. Um, uh, you know, being home with the kids, because I my kids live next door, so we're kind of quarantined together. So we got nine of us. Uh, wow you know, uh, living at home, which is, this is nice. It's nice. It's times where you're like, oh yeah, I gotta get, I gotta get out of here. Uh, <laughs> but most, most of it is good. Most of it is good. So I know we could get into the numbers about Corona and all of that stuff, but let, let's just put that aside, but let's talk about the thing that I think mostly animates almost everything that you and I do, which is, which is freedom and liberty. So as we're hearing about lockdowns being extended and just in the last couple of days, we heard now in LA where I am, now we're at May 15th and we know it'll go beyond that because it's not like you just magically flip the switch and suddenly we're all out there again. Um, and we see this cascading across the country. How concerned are you that as we just get more and more stuck in our homes, as we don't go out, as we don't socialize, as we, as you probably saw in Michigan, you can't buy seeds at stores to plant your own yeah. food. Yeah. All of these types of things. I'm much more concerned about that than I am the virus specifically. Are you sort of in line with that? And what do you make so, of the whole thing? Yeah, so I said um, back in January when we were starting to look at this, and I said, this thing is going to sweep. This looks like 1918. I said, but it's not. What concerns me is not the death rate. What concerns me is what it will do to the economy and what it can do to freedom. And I think that's, I think that's turning out to be accurate. Um, the, uh, what, what the Federal Reserve has done, what the government has done uh, is unprecedented. And it's, you know, to really fully understand it, because the, the, the system of the free market is so complex and while it has taken a beating for the last 20 years, it is very fragile. Uh, and it's as if we were all on a 747, a brand new uh, Boeing 747. And and uh, the pilot said, you know what? It's going to get really, really bumpy up here. So what we're going to do, some of you might have had maybe one could get a concussion or die. 
Um, but there are 400 of us on this plane. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the engines off. And right before we hit the ground, we're going to turn them back on. I wouldn't be for that. Uh, I would say <laughs> maybe think? maybe a couple people could bump their head and maybe we could even lose a couple of people on the plane. I hate to say that, but nobody's ever turned the engines off in hopes that you turn them on at exactly the right time before it's just a pile of rubble on the ground. Um, and that's what they've done. And I don't know how effective it's going to be. You know, they're talking about a V economy where they just turn it off mm -hmm. and then pump money into it to preserve it. And then when you turn it back on, it goes straight back up. It won't. It won't go straight back up. It can't go straight back up. First of all, you're losing, you know, 80% of jobs that are created are created by the small businessman. How many of them had enough money just to pay the mortgage and their rental on their machinery or their, their restaurant? They're not going to be able to open up. They're open. They're, they're running on about a 5% margin. Mm -hmm. How many of those restaurants are going to be able to a hold two months or a month and a half then open back up when, I don't know about you, Dave, but I'm not going to be going running out to crowded restaurants right away. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing that people are going to do. This is going to affect us uh, enormously, enormously. And there's so, something else. I, I yeah. just, go ahead, go ahead. Well, no. So with that in mind, so before we get to some of the stuff that was done wrong, what what would be the right thing to do right now? So if we're concerned about all those small businesses, I mean, I know you're not necessarily a UBI guy. You don't want the government to just be handing cash no. to people. But what is the right thing to do then in a situation like this? So I'm not a UBI guy, and I've done a lot of looking into UBI because I know what's coming with technology and everything else. And I'm I'm much more of a futurist than a nowist, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have looked into UBI. It doesn't work. Um, however, this is a different situation. I'm not talking about universal basic income, but this is a different situation. The 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 crash of 08 was caused by many things, but the government and the banks and then stupid people listening to the government and the banks. That's why that was caused. That and greed. It just caused that thing to melt down. That wasn't my fault. Why was I bailing out the banks? It wasn't your fault, Dave. Why were you bailing out the banks? This is different. No, nothing anyone did except for China mm -hmm. caused this. The government turned it off for the first time in history and said, you cannot go to work. Well, Article 5 in the Constitution says, you better give me some money because you've just destroyed me. So you have to make me as whole as you possibly can. So I am for, in this particular case, the government coming up with ways to feed money into the system and help those at the lowest uh, rung of the ladder, including those small businessmen who are just barely making it. Now you've destroyed them. Instead, what we've done is we've, we've taken $7,500 from every American or 16,500 16, from every taxpayer, mm -hmm. $16,000 from every taxpayer, and then given some of those taxpayers a check for twelve hundred dollars. That that's that's not helping. We, uh, yeah. We've taken two and a half trillion dollars and only given three hundred and fifty-five billion to small businesses. Where's the rest going? Same place it went last time. Right. So with that in mind, is is this just one of these things where our system is so is so broken in so many ways that every time we try to do something to fix it we just create more problems. Like we, yeah, we extend it. So we, we yeah. survive 2008, but then we, we make two, you know, banks are too big to fail. What do we do? We make them bigger. Uh, that we just create Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid when my hope is that, at, that this thing is so profoundly different that maybe it actually will get people to look at the root causes and think about it all differently. Do you think there's any chance or am I just a dreamer? I think you're a dreamer on that one um, because the damage has already been done and the system has already changed. I think it's been baked into the response. Um, you know, the Fed had prepared this. This was a prepared response. 
Um, you can read it in their own notes. Uh, they knew exactly what they were doing when they came into the president and he said, we've got to quarantine the country. What do we do? The Fed handed him a book and said, here's what we think should be done. They had already war gamed this to some degree. Uh, and uh, so the change was already baked into it. Let me give you some stats. Sure. The Federal Reserve is purchasing $625 billion per week of U.S. Treasury bonds. That's our debt. Plus U.S. multiple uh, municipal bonds, our city bonds, and our corporate bonds. At that rate of spend, the Federal Reserve will own all outstanding U.S. public debt, federal and local, by September of this year, and all corporate debt by December of this year. They are now pledging uh, $200 billion a month to U.S. banks plus Fannie and Freddie to buy all distressed mortgages. They are officially today, not in the future, today, the largest landlord in the world. By the end of the year, they own almost everything. Uh, so where do, you go, where do you go for a free market? Deutsche Bank just said over the weekend... Um, a few days ago, that it was uh, the end of the free market. There, Because of the Federal Reserve, there is no free market. And the bad thing is, it's not the Fed. The Fed just did all this behind closed doors, did it mm -hmm. without discussing, did it without any members of Congress being involved, and our Treasury is the one that guarantees everything. So when they all go bad, it's on the taxpayer again. We are propping up the world as a taxpayer, and none of us have been consulted. It's really, really dangerous. Really right. dangerous. So there, there's so much stuff there. But for, so for the average person that you know, they hear the Fed, they hear the numbers you just lay out, they hear debt to China, all of these things that you know, you're the average person. You maybe have a job, maybe don't right now, and you're trying to figure out how to live your life, but you want to pay some level of attention to this. Well, is. What do you do? I mean, what what could we have done or what could we do now to reverse any of this? And and if Trump was We've there to, to drain the swamp, <clears throat> did he just did he just utterly fail then? No, I don't think he I mean, you can't shut the engines off without juicing the system. You you had to put the money in. If your choice was tell everybody to stay home, you had to juice the system. The the problem is, I think this was much, I think we took some of the wrong steps. I think listening to the Federal Reserve and to the five biggest banks in the world, um, they were the ones that got all of the candy. Meanwhile, they are making it more difficult, just as they did in 2008, for people to go get a mortgage. You need the average person to be able to have money. Mm -hmm. Instead, why didn't we say to the banks, you know what, you guys got bailed out last time. Um, no mortgage payments for anyone, business or home, no mortgage payments for three months. Mm -hmm. No college student uh, loans, uh, no loan payments for college students for three months. All of these things should have been suspended. Instead, people who can't pay their rent are getting a check for $1,200. Well, in New York, that's not gonna do it. $1,200 is nothing in New York, nothing. Won't pay for your food in New York. For, for a little perspective, my, my sister who lives in New York City, although she's not there now, lives in a, a one bedroom converted into a two. So it's a fake two bedroom apartment. The rent's around five grand a month. So yeah, just to give a little yeah. perspective on that 1,200. So right. what, do, what do we do? So, so the libertarian, classically liberal-minded people that are hearing, okay, so the Fed, all of this stuff is happening. It's, it's, it's just solving problems that they created, the rest of it. What should the states be doing? So you mentioned you've got Abbott there in Texas. He's doing, it's seemingly trying to protect some of your civil liberties. I've got a different problem here mm -hmm. with Gavin Newsom in, in California. But how do we decide in a time like this what the states versus the Fed should be doing? I wish we were having more of a conversation about this. It's it's pretty rare. And I, I don't do know. If, did you did you happen to see that crazy tweet by CNN's unreliable sources, Brian Stelter, who had this anonymous source that told him that Trump's leaving it up to the governors, as if that's somehow scary. I mean, I would prefer that the governors have more choice. But how how do you decide? It is the way the Constitution is written. It's crazy. Yeah. Look at these people. 
Look yeah. at these people. Uh, he's leaving it up to the governors to decide. <laughs> that guy's a total fascist. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. That's yeah. the way it's supposed to be. The, everyone who was so concerned that he would grab power when he doesn't tell manufacturing what to make, they mm -hmm. freak out. Uh, I don't know. If maybe your definition of fascist is the opposite of mine, but that's what the president should be doing, saying, no, I'm not going to take over co uh, corporations and tell them what to do. I'm going to ask them. I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell states what to do. And you know what? Honestly, the governors should not be telling the local cities what to do. The mayors should say in our town, this is what's right in our village, our city. This is what's right. And the governor can help coordinate. It's always power to the people. The closer you get to the house, the more important it becomes. But what How is say? Donald Trump the bad guy here? Yeah, but what do you say to the people? Because I hear it all the time, Glenn, because you're, you're singing my tune. I say these types of things and people say, well, if you leave it all up to the local uh, officials, one city might be doing the right thing, but the city next door might be doing something terrible and we know viruses don't care about borders and things like that. H how do you manage that then? The virus doesn't care about borders? Of course it does. Why would we stop all air travel from China? Of course it does. You, you just have to defend your border as a town. If somebody next to you, the town next to you, well, then you're not coming into our town. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to do it, but it's an, uh, in, an imperfect system. As Winston Churchill said, it's, <clears throat> it's the worst system except for everything else. Right. So, I mean, it's not a perfect system by any stretch of the imagination but you have to trust the people. It is the people, it is their rights. I just saw a, a video of someone being shut down and the police officer saying, uh, your rights have been suspended. Yeah, so I My rights have been suspended? How do you suspend inalienable rights? Oh, I know, you can't. You can't suspend rights. You can say for, for health purposes, but only the state can do that, not the federal government. And by the way, what the guy was doing was sitting in his car where they were gonna have church services, where they were all gonna be socially distanced from each other. So it wasn't even as if in they the were car violating. With yeah. the windows rolled up, yeah. with the windows rolled up. How afraid are you generally that we're just gonna kind of keep giving away these things that, that the time, the calendar will keep marching and slowly, yeah, we won't go in our cars. We won't leave our house. Suddenly walking your dog will be a problem and you'll, you know, it can only go in the backyard or just like the endless cascade of things that we can think of, but I'm more worried about the things that we can't think of that they could come for. So, here's the here's the worst part. Um in the book, um, Arguing with Socialists, yeah. uh, you have a copy there. Open it I've up got to it chapter here. six. Yeah. Yeah. Open it up to chapter six. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you if you saw that one, but it's how technology and modern monetary theory can make socialism more dangerous than ever. Mm -hmm. um, this is this was this was assuming that the economic collapse would come over a slow, long period of time. Uh, that the economic collapse would, and joblessness would happen maybe because of technology. The, in that chapter, I outline what happens in that situation where it's lots of joblessness. The first thing that happens is the government needs to spend more money, and so they start to print more money. Um, <clears throat> printed in the last few weeks, more money than we uh, we digitized more money than we could have printed in a year. You literally could not print. The, there's not enough trees to print the amount of money that we have just digitized in a two or three week period. So literally, um, so it's not about the gold anymore. It's not even about the dollars because we can't print them fast enough. Now we're just truly in a sort of imaginary it's, situation. So it is called... It is called modern monetary theory. Have you ever heard of it, Dave? I haven't. I'm okay. a simple man, Glenn. This is a huge, no, 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 the, the, most people don't know it. It's a huge talking point for socialists, and here's why. 
because they've always been held to this standard of, well, how are you going to pay for it? So modern monetary theory is, well, we'll just digitize or print the money. Well, that sounds like old failed monetary policy, but this is new. And the idea is, is that as long as everybody understands that <clears throat> we can just print the money and if we need the money, we're going to have to tax everybody to death, but we're not going to need the money. So we'll just make the money and then we'll spend the money and that will help us make more money. Modern monetary theory. And if there's inflation, Ugh. we'll use price controls uh, and we'll also use taxes to make sure that people are buying only the things that we want them to buy. This is total control of an economy through a government, through the printing of dollars. That's modern monetary theory. The Fed is doing it right now, but the UK Treasury, the crown, just announced that they are using monet modern monetary theory and they are actually just printing the dollar. They're at least admitting it. We're doing it as well. In this chapter, I talk about when that starts, the government is going to know it needs tech and tech will know it needs the government. Mm -hmm. And so the tech and the government will start to work together to monitor people because they'll need to monitor and track, et cetera, et cetera. The coronavirus has made chapter six a reality. It is, you ask me, you know, how nervous are you? I'm terrified that what I wrote in chapter six is happening right now. Uh, okay, so there's so much there. So, so jumping from that, which will sort of lead us further into the book. So how much of this, the situation that we're in right now, do you think was just because our systems were collapsing in front of us. We were watching the media system collapse in front of us. We were watching academia collapse in front of us. We were watching the political establishment collapse. And that all of those collapses, and then you find a crisis that you can throw in the middle of that, lead to this perfect stew where suddenly numbers don't even mean anything and we have new monetary policy. Okay, <clears throat> so let me let me answer it this way. You know the the Reichstag fire. Of course. Never let a good the, crisis okay, go to so waste. Were, correct. Now, the Germans said, so let's separate this from what we know. Let me give you two aspects or two two answers on this. One, the Germans said that that fire was happening and then uh, the the Nazis just took advantage of it. That's one version. The other version is uh, no, they started it. And they wanted it to burn, uh, and then they used that fire. So I don't think, I don't think that that is what happened here. I don't think anyone started this fire. I don't think that. While I do believe that this did come from bats that were, you know, the specimens were collected by the Chinese and brought to that lab, it was not released intentionally. It was sloppy. So nobody created this crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a series of events that just spiral out of control. But I do believe at some point somebody came in and went, you know, this whole thing is melting down anyway. This might be a good time just to pull the plug. I do think that's a possibility. Um, Man, we, either we that all or we just become... have the craziest people in charge. Yeah, it's weird because we all sort of become conspiracy theorists, theorists, and then it's like, well, what's really a conspiracy? Not because what you're yeah. saying is it's not that it's some coordinated thing necessarily, but events transpire and feed off each other, and next thing you know, here we are. And you not only have events feed off each other, you do have bad actors. For instance, China is now telling France we can help you out all you want, but you have to take our 5G uh, systems. We'll give you all the masks that you need, but we'll mm -hmm. only sell them to you if you do. So you have bad actors doing that. And I do think that there are those who are in uh, uh, global positions, be them people uh, uh, that are you know, in high tech or in uh, high finance or governments, that do want a different system, that don't believe in the system of the West. 
uh, and they would like to use an opportunity to their advantage. I don't think it's a conspiracy theory to think that people, you know, actually believe don't let a crisis go to waste, especially since many people in positions of power have been saying it out loud recently. You know, if you look at what uh, the Fabian socialists did in World War I, we wouldn't have gone to war if there weren't a group of people that were saying, this is actually going to work to our advantage. Um, we should go to world war because we can change the world closer to our heart's desire. That's what they did then. And I think it, it, it plays some role here. So it's interesting because all of this actually is sort of directly related to why you're constantly arguing with socialists. But before we get into the book specifically, just one more thing on this generally, what do you make of the role or the state of media right now? I know you and I are in agreement on just watching mainstream media collapse and in many, and in many ways it should, but like just in the last couple of days, this insane New York Times story that sort of defended Biden because there's no evidence, even though that wasn't the standard they held Brett Kavanaugh to, or, or a million other examples I can give lately of just, you know, corona related nonsense. And, you know, two months ago, it's not going to be a problem. Now they're, they're screaming fire. I mean, all of this, because that's another piece of this that I think has just run ramshot basically across everybody and nobody knows yes. who to trust right now. So um, it's a crisis of trust in almost everything. Um, I didn't, when I was growing up, we were in the Cold War um, with uh, the Soviet Union. And I remember thinking as a kid, how could anyone believe Pravda? How could anybody believe that stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the answer turns out to be um, pretty easily uh, they can believe that. Uh, because they want to, or they're invested in in believing that, you know, to um, to turn around and say, "Ooh, my side, I've been on the wrong side," is re takes a really honest person. Dave Rubin um, sure. takes somebody who is who has real guts, uh, and it's rare, at least early on, it's rare. The people who are reading the New York Times or watching CNN and all of this garbage. They they are so deep into it now. And if you watch the media, how many of them are saying, in fact, I just I just saw something here a minute ago about how the press is yelling at Donald Trump because uh, he wants to open the country up and he wants to tell all these states open up. OK, but they were yelling at him mm -hmm. when he wouldn't close all of the states because mm -hmm. he said it's the states that should decide. So now he's kind of flip-flopped, but it's interesting that they only wanted him to take the power to control, uh, now to keep it closed, not to, not to open it up, keep it closed. It's, it's astounding to me watching the press, how they're, they're almost wanting more death, more destruction, um, more bad things to happen because the the only loser really uh, is Donald Trump in their eyes. To hell with the country, to hell with with freedom, to hell with all of this stuff. If Donald Trump, if he likes it, it's got to be bad. If he's against it, it's got to be good. And and they'll do anything, anything. It's it's. It's beyond Trump derangement syndrome as a T-shirt slogan. It is a real, true, deep illness. Yeah, see, I'm with you on this, and I've I've asked a couple guests this, and they they've said no, that no, they don't really want to crash the economy, defeat Trump. But I actually think, you know, you may remember about a year, a year and a half ago, when Bill Maher said he would gladly tank the economy to get rid of Trump if that's oh, yeah. what it takes. And I do think that the media establishment. Oh, They've gone in so deep. It's like they're the boy who cried wolf. And it's like, well, you you missed Russia, you missed Ukraine, impeachment, blah, blah, blah. And it's like now they see blood in the water. And they I think they almost oh, yeah. they almost have to take it as far as it can go to prove that they're not they, all crazy. Or something like that. Yeah, they they want this to be true. They want this to be true. Um how they can say he's a fascist 
and then yell at him when he doesn't move like a fascist uh, is crazy, is crazy. You well, are, don't, you've Glenn, gone, don't forget, you've don't gone the over other, the edge. Don't forget the other flip side of that is they'll say he's Hitler and then they'll say he's not doing enough. I mean, it's like both sides it, of this coin. That's don't what work. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't have it both ways. They, they hate their hatred for Donald Trump is greater than their love of country. Now they can say they love their country because they're fighting Donald Trump, but they're not seeing it's somebody who is somebody who is so enraged. Uh, I'm trying to think of a movie where I've seen this, where the person even might even have righteous indignation where they're just so enraged and they're just acting. And now they're starting to hurt everything and people have to grab them and say, stop it, stop, stop. Nobody's grabbing them. Nobody's stopping them. Glenn, I know you can do Star Wars all day with me. How about Anakin Skywalker on mm-hmm. Mustafar when, it, when he chokes Padme, right? And then Obi-Wan has to jump in and it, it, doesn't, it yes. doesn't end that well for, for Vader. Yes. Oh, what? As long as we're doing Star Wars, I'll ask you one more thing about Corona and then we're gonna move on to the book. So I know that you have the original, I think there are three of them, you're gonna to have to clean this up for me, three original Darth Vader masks. If there was ever a time in life for Glenn Beck to walk out to the supermarket wearing Darth Vader's helmet. This would be that time. <laughs> please tell me it you're doing it. It would be. Tell me you're uh, doing no, it. No, I haven't please. I haven't done that. Um, but I did see somebody in a supermarket here in Texas wearing a stormtrooper's mask. And I thought at first it was funny. Um until she took the mask up and she had it. You know, so the bottom of the mask was here and her whole face was out. And she's like, whew, I don't know how how these people could breathe or even see in these things. She was not joking. She really put that on like, this will protect me. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Oh, it's it's the thinning of the herd, Dave. It is the thinning of the herd. All right, well, let's, because we're people that don't necessarily want the herd to thin out, let's focus on the book for a little bit. So I, I told you right before we started that um, I, I got the book just a couple days ago, and this weekend, I would basically, I had it on my coffee table, and just every couple hours, I would pick it up, read a couple pages. It's fun. Mm. Like, you actually Thank wrote you. about politics in a fun with cartoons and little memes and images and all this stuff. You wrote about some pretty serious stuff in an actual fun way. So my first question really is, was that the plan? Like, oh, everyone's getting drubbed over yeah. the head with all this stuff endlessly. Why not give them something that it's not like, because actually in many ways, this book is not designed to read, you know, in one sit sit down or over three nights. It's sort of designed to pick it up, think about something, put it down and do it again. So I'm riddled with ADD uh, and uh, it's hard for me, especially nonfiction. I can read fiction, nonfiction, especially when it's like boring or it's got, numbers involved and you're talking about economics and everything you're like oh shut up and i just can't get through them um and so uh what i did was we patterned a book um called arguing with idiots and i know this is a little redundant but arguing with idiots i wrote about 10 years ago and i heard from so many people who are now in their 20s and 30s that said when that came out I loved that book, and uh, I used the 100 pages at the end of the footnotes uh, to go back, and I wrote papers on it, or I used it as arguments, but I didn't quote you. I'm like, that's brilliant. That's exactly what has to happen. You can't I, – I went in. If we found a, a, something, a stat or something, and we had it verified by the Heritage Foundation, I would go back and say, find a lefty organization. Find mm-hmm. the New York Times verifying this because – You need the argument that they will accept. They're not going to accept the Heritage Foundation. Um, And uh, and so it was an easy way to read it. It's a fun way to read it. Exactly right. I I have not said this out loud, but I think it's more of a bathroom book. You know, it's one of those that you you put in the bathroom and you pick it up and, you know, you you enjoy reading it uh, and you could pick it up on any page. Uh, But I did it so... Those with open minds could um, actually see the best arguments on both sides and do it in a fun way. 
so one of the things that one of the things that's really interesting to me is that uh, you know in the last couple of weeks that as Bernie sputtered and now has dropped out, there's been a bunch of yeah. tweets by people, high level people from his campaign. I think one of them was a deputy campaign manager who tweeted mm -hmm. out, "Oh, finally we can drop Democratic from Democratic Socialism." Now I've been screaming this for three years that this is the plan. They're sneaking it in, you know, they're sneaking in the bomb. And then once it's in, they'll unleash it. And of course they were gonna drop it. Are you surprised how brazenly they've dropped it? And not only that, but the second part of this will be, do you think they have to destroy Bernie in the process now? Because he didn't win, he didn't get them there. And ultimately he'll just be an old rich white man who played by the rules so that he has to be sacrificed at the altar of their socialist God or whatever it is. Uh, um, maybe because it's just such a destructive God uh, that maybe um, I think there's a chance he becomes Barry Goldwater uh, that gave birth to the Reagan movement years mm -hmm. later. Um, I think I don't think he was the the one to bring it to uh, its finish. That person remains to be seen yet um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to. Um, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, um, I can't remember. What was the other part of your question, Dave? I'm sure I should have written it down. Well, um, hey, so first, whether they designed this to d destroy Bernie, um, wait, I don't well, what think was so. the first part? <laughs> right. So they, yeah, whether they I don't remember. Bernie, oh, oh, but dropping democratic socialism really just oh, as, as an idea. Dropping itself. democratic. So yeah. Yeah, democratic socialism is crazy. First, I really believe that it was uh, not Stalin, but uh, Lenin who first used uh, the democratic socialists um, because they were afraid of communists. The Russians were afraid of the communists. And he said, no, 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 we're democratic. We're democratic socialists. Um, and uh, and so it's it's been a ruse from the very beginning. Um, it, it, when I was at Fox, I remember there was a U.S. News and World Report. It was a, a magazine when there were magazines. Um, and it had on the cover, about three months into Barack Obama's term, it said, we're all socialists now. And I remember holding that up on camera and saying, first of all, I didn't think you were socialists. Uh, second of all, what sort of bubble do you live in where you can declare for the entire country, we're all socialists now? Mm -hmm. um, and I use that to say they are dying to tell you who they really are. They've been living undercover for so long, and they've been waiting for their moment for so long that at some point the mask is going to come off, say, damn right, because this system doesn't work. And that's where we're at. We're at but, the so damn right. It? Yeah, yeah, we are. So socialists. is that it? That they are frothing at the mouth now? Like you can feel there's a certain excitement right oh, yeah. now on, from AOC and Ilan Omar, and and you also have Elizabeth Warren, who's been a little more quiet during this, uh, and Bernie. Those are the four on the cover. But but with AOC and Ilhan Omar, there's a real frothing at the mouth, a real excitement right now. Like, see, none of it works. This is the, you know, AOC yeah. had this tweet about late stage capitalism, showing people in lines at supermarkets in San Antonio. What she always fails to, to add is that, yeah, our, our stores still get restocked, unlike in socialist countries. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that, as right. you said before, it's messy. Nothing, nothing in a free society is absolutely perfect. But yes, I, I, I do see that. The mask is dropping now. And, and so that leads me to, no, they're are, are they really just communists, actually, that the next mask that drops is the socialist mask, meaning so, that they won't even have to do yeah. it through the system? No, so this is something that I clear up in the first chapter of the book. Communism is not the bad one. If you actually look at the theories of Marx, communism is the utopia. So we've switched these. It was the Soviet Socialist Republic, okay? It's the socialist side that is, uh, that is the scary side. The, the communism only happens when we all live in a happy commune and we're all saying, oh, you know what? I'll give you my stuff. Don't worry about it. And there's no big boss. There's no guns because you don't need it because everyone has come to this this communist or commune idea, and we all want to be there. 
So communism is the utopia. Socialism is the step between when you have capitalists and then you have the people who say, I want this utopia. It's this middle part. Well, you're going to have to do something to convince these right. people who like capitalism that y you want to be over here. And so you slowly drag them in piece by piece. And then at some point, you just have to shoot all the other people that don't agree with it so we can get to the happy place. Right. So this is what they're not communists. They are brutal socialists that are willing to kill, willing to do whatever it takes because the ends justify the means. I mean, this is what I keep describing as this is Thanos from the Avengers movies. What did he have to do? He had it to is. wipe wipe out half the people in the universe to create yep. the utopia. And as he said, yeah. I'm the good guy because I was the only one brave enough to do it. And can I ask you something, Dave? You live in Hollywood. Yeah. Do you, do these people even watch some of the stuff that they make? <laughs> Every, I mean, I've, especially when it comes to Marvel. I watch these things and I'm like, right? I mean, it's not just me, right? You're seeing that this is making the freedom... Uh, kind of uh, message here. It's kind of making all of the conservative or the libertarian point here, right? I don't, I don't, do they read? Do, well, I know, should just leave it at that. Do they read? Well, you know what? I think, I think you know this as someone that's been around the block. You know, a lot of the people here in Hollywood, which is, which is very much changing right now. And I think after Corona, the, the idea of celebrity and these big budget things, I think this is all going to change. But you know, most of these people privately of course they're capitalists and more libertarian minded and everything else. They push nonsense and a confused message while in their own lives, what do they wanna do more than anything else? They wanna be free, they wanna earn their money, they wanna spend it freely, but they push a message to everybody else. It's like most of our politicians. That's just counter to everything that the way they actually act. Can you believe it, Glenn? Can it's, you actually believe that? It's a, you know, it's amazing. I have, uh, I have talked to some studio heads um, so these are the, these are the big bosses, uh, and they are definitely capitalists. And they said, if Bernie Sanders is the guy, all of us are going to be voting for Donald Trump. We'll never say that because all the actors and actresses, they are, they all believe in this crap, but they'll kill this industry. He would kill this industry. Um, and so I, I know there are some capitalists out there. They're not, they're not libertarians or conservatives, but they do like their money and they know what socialism does. Exactly. All right. So if you're going to argue with a socialist, I'm going to ask you the number, probably the number one question that I get asked when I go to college campuses, which is how do you even initiate the conversation? Not if you're Glenn Beck, right? Not if you're Dave Rubin, but if you're a young kid on a college campus, and the, the terrible ideas that you write about here are taking root, and many of your friends have subscribed to them. And you just wanna to talk to them about freedom a little bit, some of this, but they are automatically gonna call you a Nazi and a racist and all of that stuff. What is a trick? Have you learned any tricks throughout this that would allow the conversation to even so get that's to the an argument? Yes, yes. So that was a key word, a key word, Dave, trick. Um, it cannot be a trick. It cannot be a uh, smooth move. Let, let me let me put this in. Uh, uh, I know I know you're uh, agnostic, or an, are you an atheist or an agnostic? Glenn, you're going to really enjoy this other book I have sitting here because I'm going to uh, talk about some things in a new way. <laughs> I, I would okay, say, all I'm, right. yeah, well, I would say I'm I would say I'm a ahead. functional I'm a functional believer. I would say at this point, sort of in the Jordan Peterson sense okay, of it. Okay, good. That, yeah. We'll, good for we'll, we'll you. Good for you. Okay, that. that's that's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me just talk to you here about Jesus for a second. <laughs> uh, and and one thing that I don't like about uh, Christian church, let me just, just take on my church. We have missionaries that go out. And I don't mind the idea of missionaries and, you know, talking to people about things. But... What, I, what bothers me is, how do we get people to talk about Jesus? How do we get people to uh, get closer to baptism? I don't know, that sounds icky. How about we love people and we listen to people and we seek out what they are looking for in their life? What are they seeking? Most socialists, I think, the ones who have not really thought it through, I'm not talking about the diehard 
uh, diehard, well, at least most diehards. Um, I'm talking about the people who are in it because they see a system, they were born, and they might, maybe their first memory is uh, September 11th. And they remember the carnage and the chaos and... You know, it was had stuff to do about big war machines and it was about oil and money. And my dad might have lost his job or the stock market shut down and it was scary. Then my next big memory is 2008 and my mom and dad lost everything that they had worked hard for and had to start all over again. And then coronavirus hit and they lost everything. This system doesn't work. This system is only rewarding the really powerful and the rich my folks struggled and i don't want to i don't want to live my life like my folks did believing in this nonsense that if i heard somebody talk to me about that i could relate to them and mm -hmm. i would agree with almost mm -hmm. everything they just said now we can have a conversation because instead of approaching them and trying to win the argument I'm trying to ask them questions to get to understand their perspective. How did they get there? Don't talk to me about systems. How did you get here? What are you really looking for? And if you're looking for uh, the workers of the world unite, I move on. Right. If you're looking to find a better way to uh, live in harmony, live some natural principles, uh, live in ways that will actually work and I don't see this system as working. Okay, great. I'm with you. So now what are the problems? Let's let's separate the baby from the bathwater. Is there a baby in that bathwater? I think there is. You may not. So let's define what that baby is and separate it from the bathwater. Yeah, I guess the only problem there sense? is that, well, of course it makes sense, but I, I guess the, the only flaw, unfortunately, is that we have just so many young people that talk about workers of the world unite, or or just the evil patriarchy, or just the the simple versions, as opposed to a complex human version of understandable things that you just laid out there. That it makes that conversation but, just hard to have. Well, it makes it hard to have in a crowd. Yeah. But nothing is ever really solved in a crowd. Um, it, everyone wants to be heard. Everyone wants to be listened to. Nobody wants to be listened to somebody who's just waiting for the opportunity to spring their, their good news on them. Mm -hmm. they, we have to empathize and really truly listen, or we're not going to make any, we're not going to make any inroads. And because and mainly because a lot of the people who are um, arguing it, they don't even know what they're talking about. So many people. Uh, on right. our side, are just spouting stuff that they heard from somebody else, and they haven't thought it through. We need, we don't need a bunch of followers. We need leaders. We need to find people that really will have a change of heart. I said to you, Dave, two years ago, we were talking about something and we disagreed on it. And I said, I think I know you well enough to know that you'll get there you'll get there because it only makes logical sense. And um, you may have agreed with me at that time kind of half-heartedly um, and said, yeah, I could see that maybe happening. Um, and that's because I respect your intellect. And there are things that are universally true. We can look at it in different ways. We can mm -hmm. argue it in different ways. But when it comes down to it, if you have a few things as your guiding principles, you will eventually find your way down here. Yeah, well, you know That's what I'd what love we to, need to find. You know what I'd love to do? I know in a couple of weeks when uh, I'm gonna be on your show to talk about my book, I lay out all of these principles and we do have some disagreements on some of these things and we could spend, let's do it. Let's spend the entire conversation discussing only the things we disagree on. It'll, it'll actually be pretty beautiful. Because I know there's a couple points I love in that. there that, that you're not going to agree with. But how much of this also is that when you, when you have a cover like this and you put these people that it's a cartoon, but they sort of are cartoon characters. AOC, Ilan Omar, Tlaib's not on the cover, but a bunch of the, the squad, they really do seem like cartoon characters. And they sort of, it makes sense that people like them want to get into politics because 
their whole ethos is about controlling people, even if even if you know it's presented as freeing people, as opposed to what I think our side would roughly be, which is about freeing people. You're not really going to want to get into politics. Like it's a much harder sell to get a strong person who doesn't want to rule your life to get into politics, which is about ruling people's lives. So there's an asymmetry yes. of there's an asymmetry of the types of people fighting for these political positions. Yes. And it's a problem. Libertarians are like herding cats. Uh, conservatives, generally speaking, uh, not all of them, uh, but generally speaking, they're entrepreneurial. Uh, they have entrepreneurial spirit. And so they just kind of go do their thing. Um, and uh, and those who those who see society as a collective, they're on the left and they they're raised, you know, and and groom themselves to be somebody who's a busybody who's caring about everybody else's business. And so they have to be in charge of something. Mm -hmm. um, and so they do. It just it's it's a lopsided um, uh, lopsided scenario here. But, you know, it's interesting you bring up they're cartoon characters and they are cartoons. But if you're if you look, so am I. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and this is a this is a statement really from the last book was uh, arguing with idiots. Um, and I don't know if you remember that cover, but I was I had dark eye makeup on to make me look really crazy. And I was in a like a uh, it was a it was a um, Russian uniform and I was standing like a dictator. Um, and I remember I walked into Fox News when that book came out. And Roger Ailes held the book up and said, why the hell would you ever look like this? Why would you ever put that picture out? And I said, because that's the way half the country sees me. And I want to poke fun at myself because they see me as a cartoon character. And they have to stop seeing me and others like cartoons. So it's kind of the same thing. The facts in here are not cartoons. But the exaggerations by, you know, these eco-socialists that we're all going to die in 12 years. Um, that is cartoon. That is a cartoon. So um, I was actually going to ask you about that. The facts are not. Can, can you talk about why they use that as a tactic? The, this sort of everything is collapsing and it's collapsing now. It, it's all always about the, you know, 12 years from now and five months from now. And you have a funny thing with Ilhan, uh, with AOC and the cow farts, because we have to rejigger everything now. Otherwise, mass death is right. coming. So here's what is. Um, it's the only reason and the only way to get socialism to be as popular as it is in a country as wealthy and where the poorest among us are in the top 1% of the world. You have to create other problems. We had, in the, in the last two years, we have had fewer deaths uh, per uh, capita than any time in American history. We have had um, more jobs and a higher percentage, or I should say a lower percentage of unemployment than ever before, at least in the last 100 years. We have it really, really good. We, I mean, people who are quote unquote poor have iPhones. You're not poor mm -hmm. and have a phone, let alone an iPhone. So you have to create a boogeyman. Uh, and the left always says that that's what, you know, the, the right does with, uh, you know, with terrorists or with uh, communists in Russia or whatever, that it's just a boogeyman. It's not real. So they'll deny real killers. In many cases, they will embrace them. Uh, Fidel mm -hmm. Castro, mm -hmm. even Hitler, Mussolini, they were all embraced by the left. Um, and they will come up with these boogeyman uh, to be able to frighten us because you have to have something to save. It, it's about forcing people um, to do something because it's right for the collective. They just are not smart enough to see it. So we need your help to round these people up, to try to convince them, but damn, they just won't see the error of their ways. Well, that kind of goes into the idea of socialism too, that a few elites know better and you're one mm -hmm. of them. You just know better. All that's right. How, that's how it works. All right. So um, taking, what's frightening taking, is how yeah, far, 
what's frightening is how far we went under a good economy. If we are indeed going to hit 30% unemployment, uh, as the Federal Reserve says, 32.4% unemployment is what they predict by June 1st. If we get anywhere close to that and it doesn't turn around when we turn the engines back on, Dave, we are we are going to be, uh, I made this prediction in 2008. If we go down this road, we will make Hitler look like rookies because we are, we are a great nation with great power. And if we go dark, we will use that power in ways the world has never seen. I, I shudder to think what we will do to our own people and to the rest of the world with great power and dark, dark collective forces in charge. Oh man, well, if, if that answer was the shutting off the engine answer, now give me the, to wrap this whole thing up, g give me some hope here. Give me, the, give me the answer that the engine can get on and functional before we hit rock bottom. It's an, yeah, it's an easy one. Um, we just have to remember that our rights are inalienable, meaning no man can change them. We don't get them from men. We don't get them from the government. You can't suspend my rights. I have inalienable rights. Um, when we remember who we are, we, we can take, uh, if, if I were on uh, an island and I had to pick a team from a country to help me put together airplane parts that are just scattered all over a field and make some form of transportation, I would pick the Americans every single time. We will figure out a way, you know, the, the uh, Enigma machine, which was the unbreakable code of the uh, of the Germans, and there was a great movie out, the Turing uh, test about the Turing test, um, and uh, Alan Turing, who was this great, great, brilliant mind, broke it in I think two or three years. It took them, and they had uh, a an Enigma machine. What isn't told is that two Americans on a Navy ship in the Pacific didn't have a machine and figured out and broke that in about six months. Mm. So Americans figure things out. We're, we're just good at that. It's that entrepreneurial spirit. If given the chance, when this thing opens up, the, the cure or the treatment or the testing or whatever it is that we need will come from, I think, either Israel or the United States of America. The answers will come to rebuild. The technology will be there and the spirit will be there if we don't allow the media and quite honestly, those who are so eager to control people that they kick the snot out of our spirit over and over again. We're not only going to survive, we'll thrive. We'll thrive because that's what we do. I'm with you, Beck. Our work is cut out for us, but... Uh... I don't have anything better to do, do you? I don't either. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life not doing that. Exactly. All right, well, we're going to put a link to the book right down below. Stay safe, and uh, one of these days we'll get to do this I'll in person I'll talk to you in a again. couple weeks. Yeah. I know. I'll talk to you in a couple of weeks when your book comes out. I can't wait. Send it to me so I can read it in advance. Uh, we're, we're going to get one out to you today. All right, good seeing you, my friend. Good. Thanks. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.